Welcome to Discovering Revelation, everybody. It's Friday night, and we have an exciting study ahead. It's been a long week. I hope you guys have been blessed. I know um, there's still been increasing updates of this whole pandemic and this virus, but we know that ultimately, as we've been studying here at this seminar, that God has it all in His hands, that He is sending our world history to a climax where we go into the new world where there is no sickness, where there is no pain, no more suffering. So we have some exciting topics up ahead. Just two more. Just two more. Can you believe it? We've all, tonight is our 22nd night studying together. And I tell you again, it's been a privilege to study with you. Tonight, our subject is the mark of the beast. Over the last few subjects, we've really been stepping back and looking at the big picture issues. Tonight is another one of those nights where we are um, going to be studying um, together or the, what we've been trying to put piece together over the last few weeks. It's all going to pay off tonight. Tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, we're going to look at a peculiar phrase that shows up in Revelation 12 describing God's last day people as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. And on Saturday morning, we're going to unpack that just a little. And in the process, we're going to look at a, a, another prophecy in the book of Joel. And you're going to be amazed at what you find tomorrow night. Then Saturday night. Saturday night, we're going to be talking about the last night on earth. We are going to be looking at the world to come. What's it going to be like? What, what is uh, the last night, last day on this planet um, going to look like. And then we're going to also get, I'm going to be sharing my story a bit um, and how God has led me um, along his path as one of your fellow believers, um, how he has led me and saved me. You wanna, won't want to miss either of those, so clear your calendar tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. So tonight is going to be a special evening. Like some previous nights, I'm going to present to you with a, a few decisions by the end of the evening. And that's going to be your chance to respond to the voice of God as it's presented in His Word. And as you know, you can't just read the Bible for factual information or you're really missing the point. God is speaking directly to you, your life, your heart, and He's expecting you to respond. Out of all the prophecies in the Bible, the mark of the beast is probably one that scares the most people, and that's mostly because our generation law has long forgotten some of the basic principles of studying Bible prophecy. And you, you know, there's been so many spin-offs of this idea in Hollywood blockbusters. And if there's one idea that Hollywood has milked, if there's one idea that shows up again and again in horror films, it's the mark of the beast. But tonight, we're going to push the movie industry to one side and see what God actually says in the pages of the Bible. And like other nights, I think you're going to discover that God has a very clear way of speaking to us. If you walk into any Christian bookstore, you'll look for books about prophecy. It's amazing how much variety there really is on Bible prophecy. One book says one thing about Revelation, and another book says another thing, completely different. Buy a hundred books, and you're going to get a hundred opinions. And what's really strange about that is the fact that not too long ago, our believing ancestors all agreed on this subject. They, had, they understood what was, what was believed to be the mark of the beast, and it had stand, stayed that way for a long time long time, there was a man by the name of Irenaeus who had studied and studied, and he had come to the conclusion that the mark of the beast was not pointing to any other power but us. And then you jump forward to the 1100s, and you meet a man named Joachim Fiore. He was still pretty much saying the same thing. In fact, by this time, he was able to say what you and I have been saying. The beast power that crawls up out of the sea is really a picture of a dark ages Christianity gone bad. In fact, it was so widely understood that the Counter-Reformation in the 1500s actually had to address the issue. The Counter-Reformation was worried that this prophecy was going to spread too far because everyone realized that the Revelation 13 was pointing the finger directly at the Christian church. So a couple of Counter-Reformation scholars by the names of Ribera and Alcazar came up with alternate theories about the second coming. 
Alcazar, if you remember, came up with a theory we named, he named preterism, which said that almost everything in the book of Revelation happened in the distant past, so it couldn't possibly be talking about the church. And to this day, you still come across this theory in some Christian uh, city, churches, um, but it's not really popular these days. Now, Ribera's theory, on the other hand, became very popular, especially in the 20th century. He said that Bible prophecy would mostly happen in the distant future, in the last few years of human history. Now, today, the, we call that, that the theory futurism. And even though the first 1,800 years of Christianity wouldn't have recognized it at all, it has now become one of the most popular theories in the world. In one of the most popular forms... It teaches that the beast power appears after the Christians are quietly taken to heaven, which of course would mean there's this rapture, and then the beast power just kind of has the world. Now, at first, these new theories really didn't gain much ground except in counter-reformation types of circles who needed them. But then in the 1800s, futurism in particular suddenly made what mainstream. In the 1800s, it became popular enough that people stopped preaching what the Christian church had always known. And it turns out that that development was also part of the prophetic scenario. Tonight, let's pick up the story one more time in Revelation chapter 12. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is a passage that we've already studied in detail. The pure church, God's people, had to go into hiding away from the impure woman that was sitting on the throne of Western Europe. The church had married the state, and the results were disastrous. So all across the Western world, key groups of Christians had gone into hidings. The Waldensians, the Ethiopian Christians, the Celts up in, the, in, the Brit- in Britain, the Huguenots in France, they were key groups of believers who would, were not particularly welcome in the Holy Roman Empire, and that they had to, so much so, they hid themselves in the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time or in some passages, 1,260 days, and in other passages, 42 months. This is the period of time many identify as, label as, the Dark Ages, where uh, the Bible-believing Christians had to escape and flee for their lives. It all begins in 538 AD, when the authority granted to the bishop of Rome by the emperor Emperor Justinian becomes a reality. And if you remember, there were three tribes who stood in the way. And by 538 AD, the last of them was destroyed. And now the power of the Roman bishop in the Western Empire became supreme. Then exactly 1,260 years later, in 1798, one of Napoleon's generals marches into the city of Rome and takes Pius VI off the throne, the Pope dies in captivity, and this is the year, 1798, that the beast receives a deadly wound. And during this time, between 538 and 1798, the impure woman is on the throne of Europe, and she persecutes the pure woman of Revelation 12. And the Bible says the persecution will become very bad. Read here, 12, Revelation 12:15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now this is no um, spattering of disagreements here and there, um, some arguing in the churches. This is a full-blown persecution here. The Bible predicted that the dragon would turn up the heat. It would pour out persecution like a flood coming out of the serpent's mouth. But ultimately, he fails to stomp out biblical Christianity. Why? Because even though the persecution was really fierce, God suddenly opened a way to escape. He gives his people a way out. And now you really need to pay careful attention here. Revelation 12, 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. At some point in history here, This is talking about some point in history, the earth suddenly opens up to give God's people a place to run, a way to flee from the persecution. It's as if the planet suddenly gets bigger 
and God's people suddenly have a new place to go. So let me ask you a question tonight. Because you and I have the benefit of hindsight, where did the persecuted masses of Europe flee to from persecution? Where did God's people go to find religious liberty? It was right here, the new world. There's an old statement that is sometimes attributed to James Madison, even though we're not entirely sure he's the one who said it. Um, But the founding fathers of the American Republic understood very clearly exactly what they were building. They were building a place where persecuted people could finally be free. And they did not want to repeat what happened in Europe. Read James Madison's statement here. The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe with blood for centuries. The founding fathers of, American, of America knew exactly what the problem was, and they knew exactly who the culprit was. So they designed a place where people of faith could be absolutely free, a place where the church could never seize the reins of government like it did in the Western Roman Empire. America gave the world absolute freedom from religious persecution. It offered us freedom to live according to the dictates of our conscience. People were free to worship God however they wanted, and they were also free to not worship God if that's what they wanted, because America was designed to be free. The government couldn't kill you for your opinion, and even though our freedom was definitely being ero- had been eroded in the last few years, this is still a free country. And I love these powerful words that are inscribed on the Statue of Liberty. Um, it's a poem by Emily Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores, send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. It almost sounds like something Jesus would say, you know, doesn't it? Come unto me, all you who are burdened, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. In the beginning, um, America was a Christ-like country. Not because they were building a theocracy, theocracy, where the churches run the nation, but because they were free to serve God. They were free to serve God as their king, not this monarch. And that's what they chose. God is their king. And if you follow the history, you discover the principles that give us the American Constitution can be traced all the way back to the days of the Reformers. And those were people who wanted freedom for individuals to worship God and the Bible as they please. And and really, one of the most amazing things about the American Republic is the timing of its appearance. Even though people had already been fleeing to the New World for a long time, the Republic was founded in 1776. Napoleon, and around that time, Napoleon's general marches into the city of Rome in 1798, and the American Republic is founded in 1796. Those two events are happening almost together, And America begins rising to power just as the beast power received its deadly wound. Coincidence? Not even close. Let's go back to Revelation 13 because I want you to see something really amazing. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. The first two verses of Revelation 13 are already in the past. But verse 3, this verse, is part that our generation needs to worry about. The Bible says that there will be a revival of the beast. Did the beast receive a deadly wound? Yes, it did in 1798, after Pius VI was removed from his throne. And the church lost possession of its lands. It looked as if the beast was dead. But the Bible says it will come back to life, and the deadly wound will be healed. Now, here's the question we need to ask ourselves tonight. Is there any evidence that this might already be happening? The answer is yes. In 1929, about the same time that America is becoming a global superpower, something really amazing suddenly happens in the city of Rome. On February 11, Benito Mussolini and Cardinal Gaspari suddenly sign a deal that restores power, land, and self-government to the Vatican. It was a huge story that made international headlines because the autonomy of the Pope was being restored. 
after a long time. They gave everything back. And it might be a coincidence, but do you know what the headlines in the U.S. said that day? Heal wound of many years. Now, is that a coincidence? Yes, it probably is. But it's a very interesting coincidence, wouldn't you say? If you go back and read the newspapers from 1929, you'll see that the whole world thought this was a very big deal. Let me show you an article from the Catholic Advocate that came a few weeks later. It is noon on Monday, the fateful February 11, and we are standing by the obelisk at the north door of the mother of churches of the world, St. John's. We have watched first Cardinal Gaspari and the premier Mussolini drive into Lateran Palace, and they are now sealing the accord between the Holy See and Italy. I do not deny it. I am in a tremble at the pregnant greatness of the moment, for my mind is dwelling not only in, this, in the piazza or on the scene behind the palace windows. My thoughts are shooting like the shuttle of a loom out from Rome to the four corners of the globe, weaving a fabric of the reverberations which this freeing of the Pope will awaken in every country. What does it say happened that day? The freeing of the Pope. The freeing of the Pope. And now the Roman church is suddenly free to start reclaiming her global influence. And the question you and I need to ask is whether or not it's already happening. Is Rome taking back what she lost? The answer is absolutely yes. And you can find it in the headlines of almost almost every single day, but the world isn't really paying attention because the world is no longer conversant in the prophecies of the Bible. In the last few years, the Church of Rome has been actively reasserting almost every single doctrine it taught in the height of its power in the Dark Ages. In 1998, Pope Paul II was getting ready for the millennium, and he issued a papal bull called Incarnatius Mysterium. And in that document, he reaffirmed the practice of indulgences, one of the very issues that sparked the Reformation in the first place. Also, in 1998, John Paul II issued an affirmation of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. That's a very old institution, and it used to go another, by another name. Do you know what it used to be called? The Holy Office, the Holy Office of the Inquisition. It's the organization responsible for enforcing doctrinal purity and the unity of the Roman Church all over the world. Then in the year 2000, the Vatican published a very interesting document. It was a document about Christian unity, specifically calling people to unify the movement you and I find in Revelation 13. They were calling people back to Rome. Listen to this very carefully. The Church of Christ, despite the divisions which exist among Christians, continues to exist fully only in the Catholic Church. And on the other hand, that outside her structure, many elements can be found of sanctification and truth. That is, in those churches and ecclesial communities which are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. Now let me ask you, why did it say not yet? It's because there's a clear agenda, a plan to restore absolutely everything that had been lost. There's a plan to bring us all back under the same umbrella. Follow me very carefully tonight. The wound is already healing all over the world. Christians who have forgotten the history are starting to go back, even though not one single key doctrine has changed in the Council of Trent in the Middle Ages. Not one. And the revival is building much faster than you think. Just listen to the story in The Guardian back in 2007. Protestant churches yesterday reacted with dismay to a new declaration approved by Pope Benedict XVI, insisting that they were mere ecclesial communities and their ministers effectively phonies with no right to give communion. Coming just four days after the reinstatement of the Latin Mass, yesterday's document left no doubt about the Pope's eagerness to back traditional Roman Catholic practices and attitudes. Did you catch that? Even the Latin Mass is being reinstituted. There has been a definite push for the Roman Church to reclaim the past and go back to the old ways. Now here's the amazing thing. Eventually, as the Roman church rebuilds, the Bible, Bible prophecy says that she is going to have some help from a very powerful ally. Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of where? We've seen this before. Coming up out of the earth. 
and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, who exactly is the second beast? The Bible says it comes up from the earth, from the very place God's people escaped to, from the place that opened up um, a place of refuge to the woman. This beast looks like a lamb. And who is the lamb in, the, in Revelation? Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's a beast, so it's a political power that looks Christ-like, but eventually, when it opens its mouth, it speaks like a dragon. This is another mix of Christianity and the dragon, just like Rome. And I know that some of you have already figured this out because there's only one thing in human history that matches this, but let's, let's keep reading. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The second beast is going to drive the earth back to the first beast. The Bible says it plays a supportive role and it helps restore the, the, the power and authority of the first beast. So how exactly is it? Who is this second beast? We have a lot to, uh, lots of evidence to go on. The Bible says the second beast comes up from the earth, from the very place where God's people escaped to. It is also from, it's also lamb-like. It puts on the appearance of being a Christian power. And you'll notice that it has no crowns on its horns. Now, why is that interesting? Well, the, far, the first beast had a crown on every horn, but this beast has none. And that's because this is a political power without a king. So who is this? There's only one thing in the history of the world that fits. Tonight, you tell me, what powerful Christian nation, remote from Europe, a home for the persecuted in the new world, has no king? This is the United States of America. Just consider the evidence. America begins to rise on the world stage in conjunction with the revolutionary movements that, place, that took place in the 18th century. France is pulling Pius VI off his throne, and the American Republic is established at about the same time. America has been calling itself since the middle of the 20th century one nation under God. It is still a refuge for the persecuted masses of the world, and it is almost definitely a powerful republic that has no king. Does America fit the description of the second beast? It fits like a glove. So does that mean that America is going to change? Yes. I don't know if you've noticed, but in recent decades, the whole attitude of America has been shifting. The NSA has been spying on world leaders and its own citizens. And we have been witnessing the slow uh, degradation of religious freedom. And when you begin to look at it through the lens of Bible prophecy, it all but makes sense. Something strange is definitely happening. Bible prophecy predicts an alliance between the United States of America and the Bishop of Rome. I know it sounds impossible, and I used to think that maybe, you know, it was a bit of a stretch. But then I started to read the 20th century history very carefully. Back in 1991, Father Malachi Martin published a book about the political ambitions of the Vatican. He was a professor at the political, uh, Pontifical Biblical Institute at the Vatican, and his book had a really long title, The Keys of the, This Blood. Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the New World Order. It was a book that really rattled some officials at the Vatican because it put all the cards on the table, so to speak. It pulled back the curtain and showed us Rome's agenda. Listen to this. The goal is a geopolitical structure for the society of nations designed and maintained according to the ethical plans and doctrinal outlines of Christianity, as taught by who? The Roman pontiff as the earthly vicar of Christ. He was telling us that John Paul II had a clear agenda. He wanted to provide a political structure that unified the whole world and gave it religious guidance. There were just two obstacles standing in the way. Over in the Soviet Union, the world communist agenda was standing in his way. And of course, here in the West, the principles of religious liberty were going to prevent any unity of church and state and discourage people from supporting any kind of world government. Now you'll notice, one of these obstacles is already gone because the Soviet Union collapsed almost overnight back in 1989. And the question you and I need to ponder, 
how did communism fall? How? Was it really just hard economic times? Not quite. The Vatican knew that they couldn't topple Russia all by themselves because the Pope doesn't have an army. But they needed, what they needed was a really good ally. So John Paul II went looking for one. And what he noticed here in the West is that Americans also don't like communism. And Ronald Reagan really hated communism. Do you know, you know remember, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Reagan was perfect, the perfect ally. Now, watch what happens next. Reader's Digest told the whole story back in 1990 after the Soviet Union collapsed. In 1981, the communist bloc got another shock. A new American president, Ronald Reagan, began fulfilling his promise to challenge the Soviets, Soviets, not placate them. Over the next few years, he accelerated the military buildup and announced the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Soviets in 1981, excuse me, the Soviets... Confidence was shaken. Military pressure from America and its Western allies had caused the Soviets to flinch. John Paul II and Ronald Reagan, it says, this is my guy. This is the perfect ally. And just, he just happens to be the most powerful man on earth. So Washington gets a phone call from the Bishop of Rome and together, John Paul II and Ronald Reagan developed a plan. In July of 1982, they met to discuss a strategy for bringing down the Soviet Union. They decided they needed an insider, someone on the inside of the Soviet Union to help them. And they found that man in the Pope's home country of Poland, a man by the name of Lech Wałęsa. He was the leader of Poland's solidarity movement. Perfect perfect insider. So Reagan and, and the Pope contacted him, and they gave him all the support he needed. Cash, phone lines, moral support, fax machines, you name it, they gave it to him. Now, of course, the Soviets, you know, they saw that was happening. They tried to shut it down. They threatened to send troops into Poland to squash the Solidarity Movement, and that's when John Paul II said he would go in person to stand in front of those tanks, if that's what it took to stop the Russians. It was one of the biggest high-stakes political games in modern history. Here's the story again from Reader's Digest. With the Pope's support, solidarity was formed, and John Paul II sent word to Moscow that if Soviet forces crushed solidarity, he would go to Poland and stand with his people. The Soviets were so alarmed, they had to plot to kill him. When the communist government fell, the impact on Eastern Europe was electrifying. Let me ask you again. How did Soviet communism really fall? The first and second beast worked together to make it happen. And that's, that's historical fact. Maybe you remember the headlines from 1992 when Time magazine finally spilled the whole story. The headline on February 24, 1992 read, Holy Alliance, how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. Now think about this carefully. Almost 200 years ago, the book of Revelation said there would be an alliance. And back in 1980, nobody would have believed it. But prophecy was absolutely right. And that means the alliance is already here. It also means that the Vatican's first obstacle, the Soviet Union, is already gone. It's us, friends. It's a separation of church and state here in the West. And as long as the wall between church and state remains, as long as Americans resist world government and they fight for religious freedom, Rome can't have everything she wants. Now, obviously, the Bishop of Rome can't fight America on the battlefield, but he doesn't really have to. All he has to do is change our minds. All he has to do is influence the way we think. And that's been going on now for years. Do you think it's coincidence that every time we've had an election in recent history, the Pope's opinion really seems to matter to the American public? Not at all. And if you listen carefully, you'll notice in recent decades, there have been a strong religious voices calling for the end of separation of church and state. In fact, there are surprising voices trying to convince us that there was never a separation. I hear those voices often. But those voices are wrong. Just listen to the words of, of Thomas Jefferson. 
believing that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So one of our founding fathers, this is where we started. When the American Republic was born, it was a country that did not want problems that Europe had. That was the whole point of the nation. But amazingly, in recent decades, there have been loud voices calling for the removal of that wall. Richard McMunn, the editor of Columbia Magazine, led led the charge back in February of 1989. If Thomas Jefferson were alive today, I believe he would not only lead the struggle to scale the wall of separation, but that he would also provide the ladders. Now ask yourself, why would prominent Roman Catholic voices want the wall of separation banished? The American Cardinal Anthony J. Bevelacroix said this, The time has come to restore the vital relationship between the church and the state, between religion and law. Now ask yourself again, why would the cardinal want to build a vital relationship between church and state? Why would the wall of separation be a problem? Towards the end of the 20th century, more and more voices were called for the uniting of church and state, and they weren't just Roman Catholic voices. Even the president of the Southern Baptists, W.A. Criswell, said, I believe this notion of the separation of church and state was figment, the figment of some infidel's imagination. Now, there are more voices, more and more voices, calling for the abolition of the wall of separation. And to be honest... I can understand why. There has been so much moral decay in America that many Christians are eager to do something about it. They want to fix our broken morals. But we can never forget why we kept the the hands of the church off of the state in the first place. And I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't run for public office. I wish more of them would, but listen carefully as the winds of change blow through American politics and American religion we've actually come to the point where Christians are saying the Reformation was a mistake, a misunderstanding. This statement came from the head of one of the biggest evangelical TV networks in the world. I'm eradicating the word Protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. Now let me ask you, is that really true? Yes, it is. Christians should be united, but not through compromise. The only way for Christians to find real unity is by standing on the truths of God's Word. It is, after all, God's Word giving counsel about marriage, that is deep unity, saying, do not be unequally yoked. That's not talking about an actual yoke, that's talking about beliefs, values. Now here's another surprising quote, again from a prominent Christian leader. This came from one of the most popular TV preachers in the world. It's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd and say, what do we have to do to come home? Robert Schuller. The shepherd being referred to here is the Bishop of Rome. And he was saying that we should apologize for the stand we took in the Bible 500 years ago. Just a few years ago now, a huge gathering of evangelical Christians that went viral on YouTube, there was a video invitation from Pope Francis inviting people to come back home. He compared himself to Joseph and called us the brothers who betrayed him. But I'll take you back, he said. And unbelievably, one of the most famous Christian preachers in America, Kenneth Copeland, stood up and accepted the invitation. Listen to me carefully something remarkable is happening. We've forgotten the long history of where we've come from, and we've stopped living by the principles taught in the Word of God. The Bible says that the second beast will convince the earth to return to the worship of the first beast. Revelation 13, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. 
So what is the real issue in the last days? Is it just political power? Is it money? Is it greed? Is it intrigue? Is it pride? Just before Jesus comes, the issue is worship. It's the same issue it's always been. A fallen angel wants to worship that belongs to the Creator, and he'll do whatever it takes. He'll tell whatever lies he needs to in order to secure our allegiance. And if deception fails, he's going to turn to his other key tool, to use uh, the use of force. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand, or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there it is, the mark of the beast. And where does the Bible say that it goes? On the forehead or on the hand. And that should, and that should sound somewhat familiar to students of Bible prophecy because the Bible tells us God also put something on our foreheads. Do you remember? Revelation 14 told us that those who follow the Lamb in the last days have the Father's name on their foreheads. They have God's character etched in their minds and their hearts. And that's the part of the story nobody ever seems to talk about. Everybody talks about the mark of the beast. Everybody talks about the mark on your forehead or on your hand. But if you read the whole thing, you'll see that God, God has a mark for His people too on the forehead. Now, why does the mark go on the forehead? It's because that's where your mind is, your frontal lobe. It's where we make decisions. It's where Paul, Rome, and Paul in Romans 7, 25 says, With the mind, I myself serve the law of God. The forehead is a symbol of your mind. And why then is the mark on the hand also? Ecclesiastes tells us, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. According to the Bible, both God and the beast have a mark. They have a sign. They have a seal of their authority. Both of them have a mark of their claim to your life. And believe me, you want to make sure you know which mark you have. So what is the mark of the beast? This is really very simple. All you have to do is look at the people who do not have the mark of the beast in Revelation 14. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now I want you to notice, these people do not have the mark, and their warning to the world is not to get it. So who are these people? It spells it out in the next few words. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Folks, this really isn't complicated. These people keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And the Bible says they do not have the mark. So what does that mean? The people who do have the mark of the beast do not keep the commandments of God and they do not have the faith of Jesus. It's really that simple. But then the Bible gets far more specific because it talks about the mark of the beast and it talks about the seal of God, a mark that God puts on the forehead, their foreheads. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to him whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying, do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So where does the Bible say that we are sealed? On our foreheads. Here's another passage passage that says the same thing, Revelation 14. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. What What does the Bible say is written on our foreheads? The father's name. That's how we are sealed, with the Father's name. This isn't a wax seal. This isn't some signet thing. This is His name. And of course, we've already studied the Father's name. It's His character. That's what He told us in in Moses told us this in Exodus 34. And in Hebrews chapter 8, 
And in Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says that God is writing His law in our hearts. And again, the law is a picture of His character. Now let me show you something really interesting. Listen to what Moses says right after he reminds the children of Israel of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Do you see what the word, the, the word sign? It's the Hebrew word oath. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 4 when the Bible says that God placed a mark on Cain. It's a sign. It's a seal, a mark. Those are usually interchangeable words. And what does Moses say about the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments are a sign. They're a sign, a mark that God's people put on their hands and between their eyes or their forehead. It's a sign that they are God's people. Now, if you, have you heard of tefillin or phylacteries? It's a practice among some of our Jewish friends that stems from a literal reading of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The phylactery is a little box you place on your hand and on your forehead, and inside that box is a copy of God's law. There is no question what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the forehead and the hand. It's talking about the law of God. Listen again to what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. God's people are sealed by God's law. That's why the Father's name or character is written on their foreheads. And there is one law in particular that the Bible considers a special sign or seal between God and His people. Ezekiel 20. Hollow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Again, do you see the word sign? It's oath, like the mark that God put on Cain. The fourth commandment is the mark of God's authority. The fourth commandment is, God's, is, is how God, His people, publicly display their trust in His government. The Sabbath is how we publicly display our loyalty to the Creator. And that's the reason the devil hates the truth commandment, the fourth commandment. The big picture in Bible prophecy is absolutely amazing. The Sabbath is God's sign of authority, and that's why God's people place a such high value on it. But the beast has a sign of his authority too. And what does the beast power say is the sign of its authority. It's the fact that it changed. The Sabbath. Remember the words of James Cardinal Gibbons. Of course the Catholic Church claimed that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Don't forget, the biggest issue in the universe is worship. And the focal point of that issue for the human race is the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. What is the mark of the beast's authority? It tampered with God's times and laws, and it told the world that it had the authority to change the Sabbath. Listen to Father T. Enright. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Friends, let me ask you tonight, in the light of Bible prophecy, where do you offer your reverent obedience? From Monsignor Luis Gaston de Sayur, he says this, It was the Catholic Church which has transferred this rest to Sunday in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of who? The church. Sunday is our mark of authority. This is a Catholic record in 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof positive of that fact. Folks, the beast power openly brags about it. Rome says that she's changed God's times and laws. And the whole Christian world listens. The issue tonight is worship, friends. The issue tonight is loyalty. It's relational. And right now the question comes to you, 
Where is your loyalty? Are you following the dragon or the lamb? Tonight you've got to make up your mind because things are happening faster than you could ever dream possible. We are literally running out of time, friends. In 1998, Rome published an astonishing encyclical letter titled Dies Domini, the day of the Lord. Here's what it said. Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep the Sunday holy. Now, was that just random? Off-the-cuff statement. Not a chance. Right now, there's a massive effort to force the world to the toe line with the Bishop of Rome, and it's unbelievable that so many people are missing it. Back in 2007, Benedict XVI made an amazing demand while visiting the country of Austria. Pope demands respect for Sundays, the headline said. In 2009, there was a massive push for a Sunday observance law all across Europe, and it was an initiative that actually went to the floor of the European Parliament. Here's what it said. The European Parliament calls on member states and the EU institutions to protect Sunday as a weekly rest day in forthcoming national and EU working time res- legislation. It went to a vote, and it failed by a very narrow margin. And why did it fail? The Eastern European countries said, no, we just got rid of the Nazis and the communists and we don't want Rome telling us what to do. Then in the fall, Pope Benedict told the world in his encyclical Caritas et Veritate that the world needs one world, a one world economy governed by someone who is not a political superpower. He told the world it needs a religious authority that has been granted global power. And then in 2013, Pope Francis said this, It is not possible to find Jesus outside the church. And the mother church that gives us Jesus gives us our identity that is not only a seal, it is a belonging. In other words, if you don't join Rome, you can't find Jesus. Impossible. You just can't. Now let me ask you tonight, where do you stand? What is written on your forehead? We've been talking about this beast power and this dragon power. They're vying for your loyalty. But it's not just these powers. On On the outside, the first and the second beast, it's an internal battle taking place every day. Every day. That, that we know the, the main push of the dragon, of the beast's power, is the dragon. And the dragon is at work all over the world. The Bible calls Satan the dragon. He calls it, they, he's called a lion. The Bible tells us, pray, watch, and be sober-minded. Be vigilant for your enemy, the devil, roams around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Today, there's this internal battle. Will we follow the dictates of our flesh? These compulsions? These these long-held habits? These cherished pursuits that are taking the place of God in our lives? Will we obey our flesh as the dragon tells us to? Or will we deny ourselves, say no to ourselves, and yes to the Lamb? That is the question, friend. It's a daily thing. And if we say yes to the Lamb today, we are much more likely to say yes to Him tomorrow. But if we are saying no to Him in easy times, no to Him when it's, no one's pressuring you, how much more likely are we to say no to Him when there's pressure everywhere? We must follow the Lamb today, the one true shepherd. Amen? He's the only one who can lead us, who can restore us. He, can, he alone can awaken a desire, an attraction to holiness, or a desire to God. It's got to be a, work, a power working within us that makes us genuine children of Christ. Let's go to Revelation 15, where we read this amazing scene. 
in heaven. I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now let me ask you, have you ever read the Bible story and said, I wish I could take a stand like that? I wish I could be like Daniel. I wish I could be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and refuse to bow to the image. I wish I could be like the early Christians who refused to offer a pinch of incense to the Caesar. I wish I could stand for Jesus like they did. Tonight, you have the chance. It's not a statue on the plains of Dura, and it's not a tiny pinch of incense offered to the Caesar. It's a day. It's the fourth commandment. It's your decision to follow the Lamb wherever He leads you. And at right, at, right at this moment, you get to take your stand. Whether you're live streaming with us right now or that you're watching this on archive, right this moment, you get to make your stand. I want you to take a look at this, these uh, decisions with me up here. These are some decisions that are not easy, but they are trustworthy, for they come from the Word of God. Let's read the first one. I surrender my life completely to Jesus and the truth. Have you seen the destruction, the brokenness, the addictions caused by making you the king of your life, the queen of your life, and that you'd like to cut ties with those things and let God be your king completely in every area, your relationships, your career, your finances, your personal life, the, the times of day that nobody sees. Will you let him restore you and will you live by his truth today? Not waiting for tomorrow, but taking a step today. Will you, if, you, if that's your desire... Let that be tonight. Second, a second decision. I reject the beast and the mark of its authority. We just talked about the history of the beast, the beast wound being restored and how many people are following after it. You know what they're not following? In one specific point, they're not following the word of God. They're following the word of man. And if it's your desire to follow the word of God as you understand it and refuse the mark of, of the beast's authority, which is, which is rejecting Sabbath for this new day of rest. If you refuse that mark of authority, if that's your desire, I encourage you to take a, say a prayer tonight that God would help you make that commitment in your heart, that you would have peace with it. Third decision. I love Jesus and will honor him by keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, Saturday, the seal of God's authority. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you've studied the Sabbath and you've seen how it's, it's the seal of God. You've studied how the law, God still has a standard in place. And the Sabbath is in the heart of that law. And God expected us to be keeping it long after he ascended to heaven. And it's, if it's, you're ready to make that step and keep the Sabbath as the only holy day of your life, I encourage you to pray, tell God that this is your desire. He's calling you into his end time movement of truth. There's no time for man's traditions, friends. There's no time for what my pastor said, what the book said, what I learned so many decades ago. All we have time for is what God is saying to us right now. And if that's your desire, tell the Lord tonight. And a fourth decision. I would like to be baptized soon. Soon. Maybe not tonight, but at some point, if you would like to talk about baptism, surrendering your life fully, to God's word, into a surrendering to delight in Jesus rather than the temporary pleasures of this world. If that's your desire, I encourage you to email us 
at yakimasda at gmail. Email us and let us know you'd like to talk and we can set up an appointment. For the Lord is leading you and we want to side up and shoulder up against you to join in, this, in your journey with the Lord. And for any of these decisions, we're not pressuring you. This is a decision between you and your Savior. I just ask you to study, to pray, and to consider what you've, what you've heard tonight. It's been a, a whirlwind studying all these topics. And I, we talked about beasts and powers and, and the second coming and the law and baptism, all these things. Let us just take a moment to recognize all of this, all that we studied, it's God's purpose to protect us from the deceptions of Satan and instead draw us into relationship with him where he will restore us. He is that tender father smiling down on you I, know what you, you, I don't know what you've done in your past, what you just did today that makes you ashamed or disgraced, but God is calling you to follow him. Those people on Mount Zion in Revelation 14, they're not perfect, they're redeemed. And God wants to redeem you as well, today and tomorrow and forever. So I invite you to look into his word tonight, and see what he has to say. Go to the Gospels. Go to Psalms. See what he has to say to you tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, tonight, we're, many of us want to do something special by making a decision to surrender our lives to you, as our king to follow your Sabbath as a mark of your authority in our lives surrendering our will to you alone and refusing the beast and the mark of his authority Lord at all costs it's our desire to be yours because we don't want to put our lives in anyone else's hands except the Savior who died for us Lord we want to see those marks in his hands in heaven as he tells us the story again of how he redeemed us with an unfailing love. Father, the beast's authority is mounting in this world. It's going to mount on us soon. So we pray, Father, that you'd prepare us for that time, that we'd be so in love with you, that we'd stand firm in your truth, unflinching, and we'd be so in love with Christ that we would desire to tell that truth to anyone and everyone at all costs. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this truth you've brought to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming, folks. And remember, tomorrow our subject is the testimony of Jesus. See you there, good night, and God bless.